Hello and welcome back to Q Focus. I'm Mark, joined again by Pete Dillon and Doug Pollard. Mm -hmm. This time we're going to talk about um, a speech that was made by Justice Sir Michael Kirby speaking to the New South Wales Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby recently, um, basically asking for all of us to stand up and be counted and to come out of the closet. Doug? Yeah, that was an uh, interesting speech coming from him. I mean, he is what you might call one of the senior elders of our community, at least by virtue of his position. Mm. Um, um, but he said some rather contentious things as well. He said, for example, that um, discrimination wouldn't end in our lifetime. It's uh, going to end in my lifetime, let me tell you. <laughs> but this is interesting coming from Michael are Kirby. Oh, yeah, I am. Interesting coming from Michael Kirby, who I hold a great deal of respect for, but who came out very, very, very late in his life and only when his hand was forced, if you remember. You know, it was probably only six or seven years ago that he came out because of... Um, who was this? Is it was it Bill Heffernan? Bill Heffernan, yeah. Um, bang Whom on he about is now him forgiven, by the way, in case. Bang you on using, uh, you know, about him using government vehicles to pick up rent boys at the wall in in Darlinghurst, which was a total fabrication. fabrication. But you know, that's when Michael's hand was forced. He's been with with Johan for you know twenty five years or something thereabouts. He has lived openly with his partner for thirty seven years. Thirty seven years. I knew that's it was a long time. <laughs> God, that's my entire lifetime. He's lived mm. with Johan. But well, he's sort of claiming to have been out all that time. That's what Not that publicly out, yeah. yes. But Go then on. doesn't that, shouldn't he be practising what he preaches? Like if he's, if he's talking about this now and he only came out about seven years ago, aren't you really, you well, know, I shouldn't guess, he I, have done it a long I guess time he's ago? saying he's, he's lived openly with Johan for 37 years, but from a public perspective mm. and as you know, the Chief Justice of the High Court, um, he may not have been as living as openly as, as one would consider living mm. openly. Mm. Well, perhaps he didn't want to be a poster boy for the movement, as I mean, so many prominent public people say, I don't want to be defined just by the fact that I'm gay. Mm. That, may, that, <clears throat> that may have been part of the argument, I don't know. But now he's saying that um, we all have to come out because that's the only way we'll ever combat prejudice. And he gives the, ex the example of, um, I'd, I'd love the list, actually, Asian Australians, Arab Australians, Aboriginals and Refos is his mm -hmm. list saying until people got to know them personally there was racial prejudice against yeah. those people once they knew them as neighbours as friends etc but gays can choose to live a secret life and that's what we've got to stop doing this really gets my back up this comment and um, this this whole looking at eth ethnicity and the assimilation of ethnics into our community because Why? he obviously lives in a very very nice suburb where everybody gets along and doesn't obviously go to the west of Sydney where there is still enormous amounts of hatred and disrespect for people who are of, if I can quote, Middle Eastern appearance or whatever it may be. There's still enormous amounts of prejudice against Asians, against Arabs, against anybody who is perceived to be different. And I don't think he's looking at it at, from a broad enough perspective. He also goes on to say after that, I think, that um, it's important for us to realise that, that many of the changes were achieved by our straight friends, which I think is another little piece of ignorance from Michael. Like I said, respect the man enormously, but this, this entire speech has really given me the... the well, he, 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 does, he does say that. He says it's important for gays to realise that many of the changes in laws and social attitudes were carried out by our straight friends. But those um, is that actually true, though? No, if you go back to the changes of legislation in Victoria where homosexuality was decriminalised, there's a couple of people who are still around as activists, and one of them is with um, the, H sorry, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, Jamie Gardner. Jamie mm. Gardner was at university, and the queer student union of that time, or the equivalent, started the move to, to lobby, um, started the activism against this, this enormous mm. amount of discrimination and that's how the ball started rolling. And it certainly wasn't Michael Kirby who was in there with them doing that. <laughs> the only reason that things get changed is if, if we actually tackle the issues one by one and we meet the government head on. But isn't, part of, isn't that part of what he's saying? Isn't, isn't that part of what he's saying, that we have to come out and do things, we have to come out and confront these things, we can't rely on every, other people to do it for us. Yeah, but you can't get everybody to come out because, like, there'd be, 
I think you said earlier when we were talking about that people would lose their jobs if they came out or... There's implications, you know, there's, there's religious implications, there's social implications, there's professional implications, there's financial implications. It's not a matter of kicking open the closet door mm. and stepping out in a goatee frog. Well, it's, it's just and not that And simple. expecting everyone <laughs> in the community to accept it yeah, but and I don't, say, well, that's okay. I don't, I don't think there's a question of kicking open the closet door or coming out with a big bang. I think, you know, everyone has to come out in their own way in their own time. But I, I, I do think, and I have thought very strongly for a long time, that I agree with him that the only way there'll ever be any real progress is that when everybody knows they're living next door to a puff or a dyke and doesn't care. And mm -hmm. the only way that's going to happen is if we come out. But if you look at this from, from gay and married men or bisexual men who are married with children, the, the implications for you know, a whole bunch of other people that aren't gay are enormous. Wives, children, parents, etc, mm. etc. And I know, look, it's a challenge for any of us yeah. who came out. It, I think it demands a great deal of courage and self-respect to be able to stand up in front of the world and say, I'm different, regardless of whether it's you're gay or you're an albino or whatever it may be. <laughs> well, you know, you're kind of noticeable if you're well, an albino. Well, you're kind of noticeable if you're gay as well in some what, cases. What did somebody mm. once say, wouldn't it be funny if everybody who was gay turned green overnight? It'd be a very green world, and I tell you, <laughs> there'd be a lot of very, um, very tightly shut closets in places like Hollywood that would have to be kicked open, yeah, or indeed mm. in the Houses of Parliament. Indeed. Mm. So I, I, I think he's, it's it's a slightly pessimistic view of the world from Michael. I think that this this whole coming out issue for him seems perhaps a little easier, and I don't know whether it's because he does have a privileged position or whether he does have a privileged life. Well, I mean, being a High Court judge, you do live in a rather rarefied world, don't you? Quite. Um, you know, they, you, they tend to come from the upper echelons of society. They're pretty well paid. Um, they tend to be, by the nature of their jobs, somewhat insulated from real life. Um, so it's not surprising that he should see it from this kind of um, slightly ivory-towered viewpoint, as it were. But don't you think the basic principle that at the end of the day, uh, until we come out, we can't expect to be respected? Look, I it's don't. True. I think you made a comment earlier, and, and I, obviously Michael has the same idea that he didn't want to become a poster boy and didn't want to be defined only by his his mm -hmm. sexuality. And I think that's the same for a lot of people. Some of us wear it as a badge on our sleeve. I certainly do, um, but I don't think, I, or I actually do think, there's a lot of people who aren't interested in wearing their sexuality on their sleeve. Mm. They get on, they do their job, they pay their taxes, they have relationships, they hang out with their mates regardless of, of their sexuality. Mm. And it's it's not it's not important to a lot of people to to actually identify as anything. They don't want to be pigeonholed. No. And they're not like what you might call professional homosexuals like, like me we are. who <laughs> made a career out of this. Mm. Mm. So mm. you know mm. I just think we we need to be careful of not tiring each of us with the same brush yeah. and allow some individuality. Oh, I think we can agree on mm. that much. And yeah. let some wild, wild flowers grow amongst the wheat. <laughs> mm. Another interesting topic and we'll leave it there. Thanks very much again, Pete. A pleasure. And Doug. You're welcome. And we'll see you next time on Q Focus. TV Studio Q. This month is September, which is the Melbourne Leather Festival month. In honour of that, I'm here at the Glasshouse Hotel, which is hosting the Melbourne Leather Dyke competition. And I'm here to ask a few women what it means to be a queer woman within the leather community. So, come with me. With me now we have Kat. And Tracy. Hi, how are you going? Yeah, really well, thanks. Um, so you're both here for the leather Melbourne Leather Dyke competition? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, are either of you entering any of the categories? Yes, I'm entering the leather dyke category. No, I'm not entering. I'm a femme fatale gone wrong, so what can I say? Um, what is it that you love about leather? That I love the community, the leather community and the kink community, that it really honours diversity and celebrates it. Um, so the leather, when we say the leather community, it means more than just leather per se, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's about kink and fetish and all of those things, bondage, discipline, S&M, all of those things. Um, I have to ask, have either of you 
Given that um, the leather community is more open and diverse, have either of you faced discrimination from the lesbian community? Absolutely. Um, for being part of the leather community, for sure. Yes, indeed. Yep. Particular, there are bunches of lesbians that think it's wrong or inappropriate or that it's sexist or that it perpetuates sexism. And, yeah, I don't find that within the leather community. It, it really does the opposite. It respects diversity. It allows for much better communication within couples or in negotiated arrangements. So, yeah, uh, so, yeah sadly, the, le the lesbian communities can be a little bit narrow-minded about it. Uh, yeah. Um, do you think that, in general, the community has some perhaps miscomprehension, misapprehensions about what uh, what is involved in leather? Absolutely. I think they think it's about pain and domination and they don't necessarily understand that it's about consent and, yeah, that it's about safety and fun and an exploration of sexuality. Yeah. What's your favourite leather accessory? Oh, I, I love the choker, but that's just me. <laughs> it looks pretty spectacular. <laughs> And do you have a favourite? Absolutely, my 19 inch vlogger. Ooh, ouch! <laughs> she uses it extremely well. She's a master. Fabulous, thanks very much. Thank Great you. to talk to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, what that was? Yeah. Oh, that's a rope harness, so it's a form of bondage. Um, so it can be like in of itself, but it then can be used then for other rope to then be added onto it to uh, hold the person to equipment to keep them still, or it can be also just a form of restraint so that they uh, can feel the rope around them and, and uh, have that control that way. But, um, I've been decorated as well as being controlled, um, but it's a consensual thing that is a lot of fun, I think, for both of us. Absolutely. <laughs> Mutual respect and trust as well, and still naturally within the realms of safe, sane and consensual, which governs all form of BDSM play. Kath Jamison, magician extraordinaire. Kath, tonight you're here as a judge. Um, how did you get to be the, role, the judge of a leather dyke competition? Uh, well, they asked me, and they love me. Um, I think they think, yeah, I'd, I'd be able to give some good criticism about uh, good advice and criticism about what works. Um, I've done a bit of leather in my time. <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And when you're judging, what will you be looking for in the performers? A woman. Or a boy. Or a boy. Now, I'm looking for originality sassiness, um, their own individual take on what it needs to be to be a, a leather boy or sugar daddy yep. or femme fatale. We've got a few categories here tonight. Yes, we do. And um, in terms of individuality, your own shows are very individual, aren't they? You have one coming up? Yes, so I've got one part of the um, a Fringe Festival called Secret Life of a Woman. And so uh, there'll be razor blade eating and there'll be dating and uh, I'm also playing along the lines of women's intuition. So that's very different. So that's down at Wesleyan and it's part of the Fringe Festival in early October. Fabulous. Thanks, Kev. <laughs> no worries. Now let's get back to it. <laughs> Thanks. Hold up. <laughs> With me I have Lima. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Suitably fabulous, I think. Yes. You're looking very, very fabulous. I'm feeling a little bit fabulous tonight, actually. Thank <laughs> you for noticing. Yes. Um, so, what is it about leather that really turns you on? Mm, it's the scent. It's the feel of it, and it's the culture. It's how I identify, I guess. Ah, yeah. Good. Um, so you don't identify as lesbian? Um, well, I guess I am a lesbian. I mean, I don't fuck men, but. Um, I identify as a leather dyke, 
and that's very separate for me. I mean, I don't hang out in the girl bars. Um, I'm into the leather community and I'm a very minority minority within that and I'm proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> Are there many uh, lesbians active within the leather community? Um, not as many as what we'd like, you know. I, I, I think it'd be great to have more. Yeah. Um, when we talk about the leather community, it's not just leather, is it? Can you explain what it means to be a part of the leather community? I think it really comes down to self-identity and whether you're into leather latex or bondage or corporal punishment or whatever it is, it's about translating your fetish and being who you are and having the guts to go out there and be it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm getting cold on stage. You're getting cold on stage? Yeah. Um, I will warm you up if you like. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. I think you should warm me up. Right, thank you. <laughs> Here are your gift vouchers, $100 each. To for Maki Desaad. Enjoy your leather. Thank you for competing. Well, that was fun. I hope you've enjoyed the night and um, congratulations to the winners of the Miss Leather Night competitions. Remember, if you're playing with leather, safe, sane and consensual. That's the message. Have a good night. Well, we recently heard their song Superstar in its entirety. Now let's meet them in person. The girls from Melbourne's fabulous electro-funk outfit, Glovebox. And for the first time in Studio Q, um, another fabulous group on the Melbourne music stable, uh, Glovebox, and they're joining us right now. Mish and Sarah, how are you girls? Good, thanks. How are you? Oh, not too bad, you know, battling on. Battling? Yeah. <laughs> now you guys, we haven't uh, talked before. How long have you been together? Um, Glovebox has been together for about two years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what brought you all together? Did you were you music students or you know what's the go? Uh, well, actually, Granger and I. He's not here because he's not gay, and, but I am, and so Seth. Don't <laughs> discriminate. He could have come. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, you know he's got a baby and he's got to look after it tonight. And Fair enough. No babysitter. We'll forgive you. Yes. Um, so we started writing about eight years ago, mm -hmm. and then you know wonderful Seth came along and Morris came along and um, we made it. A band. Fantastic. How's that? Yeah. Good. So, what? What's the ratio? Like three queer people and one straight boy, or fifty-fifty? No, two, two married guys with kids and two gay. Wow. Two gay women. Women. That's that's pretty trippy, isn't it? What uh, What do you play? I play everything. Oh, you're multi you're <laughs> yeah, multi you Yeah, they just mime. Oh, I see. <laughs> so <laughs> you're you're a walking backing track. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the singer in the band. You're the vocalist. Yes, oh, vocalist. Fantastic. And she's the drummer. She's you're the performer in the band. Yeah, she is. Yeah. So you're the theatrical one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Have you got a big? Are you interested very much in the theatric theatrical aspect? Because I know the minority have said that's a big uh, element for their performance is actually making it just more than the music. What about you guys? Are you very much into? the performance side of it? Well, I think we are. Mm. I think we are, yeah. I wanted to um, go to Hollywood and become a movie star when I was six. <laughs> so that might have something to do with it. Oh, yeah? Who, who was your Hollywood idol? Um, I think it was Johnny Depp. <laughs> who? Anyone jump street days? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Depp, <laughs> big spunk, yeah. Well, fantastic. Yes. Well, you've actually halfway gotten there, haven't you? Because you've been to the US on tour. Oh, uh, yes, we have. How, how did that all go down? Uh, it was it was awesome. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, where, where were you playing? We played 20, 20 venues, twenty venues I think, in like thirteen states or something. Eighteen. Eighteen. States. We we went. We started off in LA, went all the way up, all the way through, and all the way to the to the other end to New York. Mm -hmm. And we drove. We travelled as far as it as long as it takes to get from um, Melbourne to LA. Flying, wow. we drove it. Dr long drove it. Way. Yeah, drove it. Mm. It was so, incredible. So, was it a traditional road trip? Many, yeah. many road trip tales to tell. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> but none airable here, eh? <laughs> road trip tales. I don't know how many. Well, you'd you know, if you've got the time. <laughs> oh, over, say, several years. Right. <laughs> okay. But a big difference in the crowds from LA to like. Did you play any really, really kind of conservative places that might be regarded as conservative? Or? Poison. 
Yeah, Boise. Have Boise, you heard of Boise? Yes. Yeah. You've heard of it? I've heard of it, yeah. Right. What, what was the go there? Oh, it was weird. Why? It was just weird. Potato country. It was, oh. it was very Yeah, no, but it was like walking. Christian sort of. Yeah. So they came mm. waving their, their Bibles and their crosses well, and their garlic at you? You know, well, it could have been, you know. <laughs> it, it, was like, it was like a movie set. It was so clean. It mm. was It was, it was incredible. Though. It was very absolutely. Pretty. It's all the buildings were front or something. Yeah, yeah. so clean. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Really? It was a shock. Oh, right. And, um, you didn't play in Salt Lake City? Or? Yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. And in was, Mormon country, how was that? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually all right. Yeah, it was a really good gig. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was the area that we were, because that's what we thought. We thought Salt Lake City would be real, like much more like conservative yeah. and, and whatever but it was actually a bit of a scary part of town where we were it was oh, odd. Yes. odd yeah no, we stayed in a really shitty hotel it yeah stunk. it was dodgy oh, look, yeah. i wouldn't expect anything else from a hardcore <laughs> band come on Not none of this hilton crap <laughs> it was, there was piss on the carpets and all of this oh, well, it was foul. I must have been exciting for oh. you but going that far honestly <laughs> <laughs> i mean it was yeah. bad. You didn't have to give all of that. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Heard you've had a record do quite well over in the US too, yeah? We've got a single, yeah. It's yeah. a remix of Superstar. Um, oh, not... Um, no, oh, no, what no, was his name? It's our song. Oh, it's our right. song. <laughs> <laughs> another, another Superstar. <laughs> no, Superstar. So, remix and... Well, we've got, we've got a, a, like a, a normal version and then we've got the remix electro version. Oh, and so that's the actual clip that we made the film clip to it and it's going really well in the dance in the dance charts. Well, we're seeing a bit of that clip right now as we speak. Um, where did you make the clip? Uh, we made it in Brisbane. Ra okay. We flew up to Brisbane for it. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, was that, were you offered like a deal up there or was it just cheaper up there or I what? Well, the director lives in Melbourne but the producer was in Brisbane oh. and so, yeah. Oh, fabulous. Mm. Okay. Um, have you got an album on the boil? Yes, we do, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Glovebox Self-Titled Album. Glove box. Wow, that's creative, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Why, so, where did glove box come from? The glove box. Yeah. You can't answer that. No, I can't. <laughs> she can't. Too, too late. Actually, it, it's oh. a Photoshop font, and it looked good. Oh. But it's not the actual font. But I liked the word when I saw it. Glove what box. It rolls off the tongue. Those are nice hard consonants. Yes. yes very memorable. There's, there's dirty things to it, but I didn't realise yeah. that. I don't we won't go into that. No. <laughs> Our viewers don't need any any clarification on that, I'm sure. Jim girls, thanks so much for coming in and sharing Thank some you. of your uh, rock and roll lifestyle. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. And make sure you catch Clubbox soon at one of the upcoming shows, Tuesday, October 3rd at 8 p.m. at Revolver Upstairs on Chapel Street, Saturday, the 7th of October at 5 p.m. at the Brunswick Hotel or Friday, October 20, 8pm at the Commercial Hotel, Yarraville. Check out www.glovebox.net.au for more details.